Since the state stumbled upon a multi-billion dollar surplus this year, thanks to several legal settlements with Wall Street banks, there has been a lot of discussion about what to do with the money. Some say infrastructure, others say health care, then of course there is education. The New York State Association of School Business Officials is out with a new report that says while education funding has increased overall over the past decade, contributions from the state are actually on a slight decline. So it is no surprise that this organization is pushing for the surplus to be put into schools. Michael Borges is the executive director of this group. He is joining me in the studio to discuss. It is good to see you back. Thanks for having me. Um, so this is actually really fascinating because what we hear from a lot of, I don't want to say the opposition, but the other side that says New York is already spending too much, the highest per pupil, mm -hmm. among the highest per pupil in the country, et cetera, um, you know, say that spending has increased and funding has increased, and it has, yes. but not at the state level, actually. Right. Well, I mean, you know, you, you saw um, during the Great Recession, you saw a decline in state support for schools, um, the commitment to fund the foundation formula that which was established in 2007 was never fulfilled. Then you had the implementation of the GEA, the Gap Elimination Adjustment, right, which right. still after several years now of restoring parts of the GEA, there's still at least a $1 billion left in GEA restoration still needed. And there's about $4.7 billion in foundation aid formula that has, been not, has not been met. So, I mean, the state's commitment to um, restoring funding and providing full funding for schools still remains to be uh, fulfilled. Um, and so there's been uh, sort of a reset. We've, we've started climbing back up to where we were, but there's still a long way to go. It's actually, I've never seen this put quite this way before. Uh, th there's three sources of education funding, which right. we know, local, state, and federal. Correct. Local share is 55%, which is more than half of the money, And actually. that has grown since the great recession. It used to be more like at 50 percent and uh, the state's the state share has shrunk by 5 percent uh, or you know, state, uh, mm -hmm. state, state share has shrunk yeah. by 4 percent and then the uh, local share has increased by 5 percent and then the federal share decreased by 2 percent. So there, you've seen a shift f to local property taxes as being the primary source of funding for schools and away from state aid. Right. So um, and you know that that's falls you know especially hard on on you know high need school districts as which don't discussed. have those resources. Yep. So you know again the our, our report just wanted to point out that um, that there's been a shift in funding that um, there has been a large increase, a dispor disproportionate increase in funding in non-general education spending. So which right. is means like special ed and um, transportation and things like that. Well, and pension costs. Uh, and pension costs. Uh, yeah, I was going to get to that. Yeah, well, <laughs> that is, I mean, that seems to me to be the largest, actually. Yes. 200, this is not a typo, 299% no, over 10 years. Yes, and that's just the average. I mean, you have other parts of the state. Uh, where you saw pension increases even higher, like Long Island and the Hudson Valley. But overall, statewide, pension costs have increased by 299%. But I don't know what you do about that. I mean, we have had sort of exhaustive discussions on this show and sort of writ large in state government about what to do about pension reform. And the governor's answer was, well, let's create a sixth tier. Correct. And that's helpful, but only in the long term. Correct. There's also pension smoothing or share or, or uh, borrowing against which your is, pension which costs. Which is a bust, which would be predicted. But, right. Yeah. So that's not a great idea either. I mean, but what what is it other than, I mean, it's constitutionally protected. There's really nothing you can do for the retirees who are Correct. already out. Mm -hmm. You could go back to your contractual employees and say, hey, we need you to give back on, I don't know, health care or whatever, but it doesn't help you in your in your retirement fund. Yeah, I mean, again, what we're trying to point out is that, you know, the governor's been pushing for mergers, consolidations, and efficiencies. Yes, he has, right? yep. And um, most of the spending that occurs is in the teaching profession. So 76% of school spending occurs in the education part of it, the teaching part of it. And if, you're ha if your pension costs are going up by 299%, if your healthcare costs are going up by 84%, there are certain things that are outside the control of local school districts to you know, rein in their spending. A majority of school spending is really mandated by the state, either directly or indirectly. And so it's very hard for school districts to, to comply with a governor's ideas about becoming more efficient when so much of their spending is controlled by the governor and, and the state. Mm. So I think that's what, what we're trying to point out is school districts have done a pretty good job 
under the certain under, under current conditions to become more efficient. Uh, and they have done a lot of consolidations and, and, and shared services and things like that, but there's only so much they can do at the local level when you have all these requirements being imposed by them by the state. Michael, I feel like not just yourself, but obviously all you and all your compatriots, right? Like the School Boards Association and um, AQE, and they're more of a lobbying organization, but all of these groups keep coming in with their various reports and their charts and their yes. numbers, and they all sort of point to the same thing, which is to say that the state needs to do more to pony up when it comes to uh, education funding, and yet it doesn't seem like um, throwing money at the problem is going to be the answer, at least as far as the governor is concerned. And we would agree with that. I mean, money isn't the answer to all the problems that school districts face. I mean, it, again, there's mandate relief, there's using our money more efficiently and more effectively. And that's why uh, this afternoon or this morning we had our second annual school finance symposium. Mm -hmm, we brought yeah. in experts from other states like Massachusetts uh, and uh, New Jersey and Wisconsin that also have tax caps. And yet, their rankings, especially uh, Massachusetts and New Jersey, their, their students score better on national tests than New York does. We're okay. ranked 30th. So why is that? So it's possible, is what you're saying. I mean, that was part of the reason that you held this, which was yes. to say other states are doing it. They're doing something different than us. And they are. Two points there. One, Massachusetts, when they passed their tax cap, I believe also s increased their state spending Ex on public education. Yes, they did. Yes. So that was one thing that they did in terms of investing, right, To and particularly when it came to high needs district. And New Jersey was sued into spending more, if I remember yes, correctly, yes, by yes. the same people who are now looking at suing here in New York. Exactly, yes. So money is important, and it's an important part of the solution, but it's not entirely the entire solution. So I think you have to look at it in a really holistic way and figure out what really works. And, and that's what I said at the last time I was on this, on this thing. There are a lot of inputs <laughs> into successful schools yeah. and into high-performing schools. Money is just one part of it. But what else did you come away with in terms of the tax cap? I mean, do you think it's possible that the legislature, and more importantly, the governor, could be convinced to go back into that P legislation, which sunsets, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, 2016. and um, tinker with it. I mean, is it possible that you say, because the governor thinks it's a great success, I mean, pretty clearly. It, it's a great success on one end, but in terms of uh, student achievement, I mean, again, that's why we brought in pe folks from Massachusetts and New Jersey. They have higher student achievement than we do and have a tax cap. Yeah, but do they have Common Core implemented yes, the they way have, we they do? have Common they Core do. the same. Okay. Yeah, they've been implementing Common Core. But what we're trying to point out is there's a right way of doing it and there's a wrong way of doing it. And I think New York's path has been sort of misguided and needs to be re looked back and revised in terms of the tax cap. Well, what there, would you change? A, well, you know, I mean, in, for instance, both New Jersey and Massachusetts, again, high High performing states with tax caps have higher tax cap rates. They have two and a half percent. Well, ours fluctuates though, just to be clear. Yeah, but it's two percent or less. Right. So th they never go below two and a half percent. It's always two and a half percent. That's it. The other thing is um, they have a lot more exclusions than we do. And on the other hand, they also, um, their overrides, they, they don't have to go to the voters if they say with under the tax cap. So mm -hmm. we had to go to the voters whether we were under the tax cap or above the tax cap. And if they want to override the tax cap, the 2.5%, they only need a plurality of 51% and right. not the 60%. Well, that was actually also the subject of a lawsuit. Yes. Okay. Which is where right Still now? Still in the process. Still in the process. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and as is the small cities, uh, you know, lawsuit that that deals with the funding streams. I mean, look, there, there's a number of legal challenges. I, I guess, are you starting now? I mean, with the sunset is, is right around the corner, which is 2016. Also happens to be a presidential year, but mm -hmm. who knows what happens? Are you starting to lay the groundwork now, yourself and other education? interests, if you will, with key members of the legislature and saying, you know, and are they open to it, do you believe? Well, I think that um, from day one, or at least our association and other, other interest groups um, have pointed out flaws in the implementation of the tax cap. Now, you know, we've taken for granted that the tax cap's going to be with us at least until 2016. Yeah. But there, there's a better way to implement the tax cap, and we've made several suggestions on how to better implement the tax cap and still meet the goals of, you know, providing property tax relief to taxpayers. So, um, you know, we want to we want to go along in that in that route. Uh, in terms of modifying the uh, the tax cap in the state and using examples of Massachusetts and New Jersey where they have done that and achieved both property tax relief and uh, student achievement. The two things are not mutually exclusive, and that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to point out, that you can get both. You can have student achievement 
and, and property tax relief uh, and have it at the same time if it's done properly. Well, one way or another, I mean, it seems to me that it's possible that this issue is going to be revisited either via the legal system or via some sort of negotiations with the legislature. Yeah, I think the legislature, you know, could be open. I think that, you know, the, the elections will help determine that sort of receptive uh, to this proposals, um, but I also think that you know again the, the legislature needs to look at what's the long term game. You know, mm -hmm. let's not look at short term results and let's look at what the long term game is and look at ways we can, you know, go look at the foundation formula. How do we do it more equitably? You know, one of our, our report talked about Star, you know, and how that really is geared towards like the property tax freeze. Right. That money is really not based on need; it's based on who pays the most in taxes. Yeah. So high wealth school districts are getting the benefits both of Star. And this property tax freeze, is that the best way to spend our, our taxpayer dollars? You know, shouldn't we be driving more money to those school districts that are in higher in need and where those results can get the better result, you know, better uh, ba well, bang for your buck? We are out of time, but I just want to point out those people in the um, areas where the property taxes uh, and the property value is higher, those people tend to vote in yes. higher numbers, well, just, right. just saying. <laughs> Michael Borges, thank you very much for being with thank me. Thank you for I having me. It.